By the mid-60s, the Beatles had as many as six songs in the top ten at one time. Now Phil was putting even more demands on his artists to keep them competitive. He had to keep escalating the wall of sound. He had to keep going higher and higher and higher. Still, Phil Spector was a legend in the business. I myself have a tremendous yearning. The yearning to be respected, the yearning to be accepted. I see this in the teenagers, yearning to do things, to be someone, to be important, and to be recognized. He was labeled the tycoon of teen by Tom Wolfe in the New York Herald Tribune, and all the publicity seemed to add to Phil's eccentricity. He liked to be outrageous, and he liked to be noticed. So he would come into the studio in those Edwardian ruffled shirts, the cut vests, the Tyrolean boots. He wanted to be different, significant, and he needed and he craved that attention. People would laugh at him behind his back, but he didn't care because he wanted to be known as the mad genius. Spector clearly enjoyed living the high life. He bought an enormous mansion and was driven around in his Rolls Royce. But he was also gaining a reputation and a lot of enemies. But you know what? I'm sure he looked back in the mirror and said, who cares? Because when you get that kind of power and you get that, that success, does it really matter? He certainly seemed to hold his own, even with all the English groups controlling the charts. In 1965, Phil achieved one of his greatest triumphs. With You've Lost That Love and Feeling, Spectre almost created a song that straddled two eras in a way. It was almost the grand final statement of all of those late 50s, early 60s hits of his. And also something that, you know, offered a line into the new music that was being created. You've Lost That Loving Feeling was called spectacular and dynamic. It also went straight to number one. If you listen to the Righteous Brothers, you hear the wall of sound in its full form. That's it. That's what he was after when he was 16, 17 years old. It came completely to fruition with the Righteous Brothers. Phil produced two more top 10 hits for the Righteous Brothers, Unchained Melody and Ebb Tide. At 25, Phil Spector was riding the waves. You know, he was the first person to make the idea of the producer mean anything. You know, the producer used to be the guy who flipped the switch in the studio. You know, Spector single-handedly ended that. But the tide began to turn for Phil Spector in 1966 when he went into the studio with Ike and Tina Turner. The song was River Deep, Mountain High. She's a powerful singer. I mean, she, she just took that, grabbed it, and ran. I remember she said, is it okay if I take off my blouse? Because she needed to move. She, she'd been used to doing shows, and she needed to move. Phil thought the record was a masterpiece. But River Deep, Mountain High froze on the charts at number 88. He was trying to prove something at that moment of his ongoing vitality, his ability to be creative, you know, in the wake of you know, the British invasion. And when it failed to, um, you know, to be a huge hit, that was, that was a devastating blow for him emotionally. It was a stoning, a public stoning of Phil Spector. Phil felt dejected and rejected. He went into seclusion, and at only 25 years old, Phil Spector walked away from the music business. Next week on Famous Faces. By 1966, Phil Spector was known throughout the music industry as a recording powerhouse. But on his way to the top, Spector had made more enemies than friends. Phil Spector wasn't always the easiest character to get along with. He wanted it to be the way he wanted it to be. And everybody was supposed to fall in line with that. Phil was alienating the very recording artists who were making him millions. He treated everybody in his little circle of recording like he owned them. Like they say, the wall of sound, that was a good title because it was about the wall of Phil. With the horrendous failure of River Deep Mountain High in 1966, Phil withdrew from the music scene and locked